Yeah. Okay. I'll. Uh... Okay, there you are. It should be recording. Okay. So this is uh, lecture four, if I count it right. And um, we are. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so last time I was mentioning some consequences of consequences. <clears throat> and um, so let me recall. Yeah, so uh, again, AIDS will always be a Hardy field, at least till further notice. And um, <clears throat> these consequences. I think I called I num I they were number two point fifteen <clears throat> um, consequences of these earlier consequences um, consequences of consequences. Yeah. So what was the first that four? is that you can always join the whole real field to a Hardy field, yeah? HR. Um, the Hardy field. I mean, this is not the exact statement, but this is what it amounts to. You can always join all the real numbers and then uh, HX, you can always join the germ of the identity function. And then six was, uh, you can join the log. It's log um, F is a Hardy field for, here you assume that F is a positive element of your Hardy field. So, <clears throat> and then there was one more that I wanted to uh, list. Um, so those I covered. And then seven, you can also join expon the exponential um, um, for f in h e to the power f. Well, wait a minute, this doesn't look very e to the power f generates. The Hardy field. H e to the power f. Okay, and so um, proof of of the last item that I well um, as you and the usual deduction step is that you let me see. Um, <clears throat> Uh, by one and yeah, so part one of this whole thing was that you can take the real closure of a Hardy field, and part six says that you can always adjoin locks. So that means that you can, um, by extending H, always arrange that H is real closed and closed under lock. Yeah, so can arrange. H is real closed and closed in the lock. Uh, lock, lock of positive elements in H, of course, yeah, by one and six. Right, and now um, if of course, it could be that on the, that e to the power f is already there, and yeah. So if e to the power f in h, you're done. Um, so assume it's not e to the power f not in h. Well, then it's transcendental over h because h is um, real closed, and it can't have any algebraic Hardy field extensions except itself. And e to the power f 
transcendental. And then we use our criterion for adjoining transcendental elements, transcendental germs, e to the power f transcendental over h. <clears throat> and so what so uh, what does that mean? <clears throat> um, so the claim uh, enough to show enough to show. Actually, that's only one step. I, it's enough to show that in order to generate a Hausdorff field, and then the rest is showing that it's also close to the, the, the derivation. But let's first first do this. Enough to show uh, for h, h e to the f um, uh, being a Hausdorff, a Hausdorff field. Um, given h in h, uh, either uh, e to the power f is eventually smaller than h or eventually equal, um, well, or, or equal or e, e to the power f eventually bigger than h, you know, will not be equal because we assuming that it's outside of AIDS, um, right? And then, of course, there is nothing to show if H is negative. So, um, so or H is less, yeah. So, um, of course, um, e to the power f if f H is less than equal to zero in in H. <clears throat> So assume H is positive, and now you just take logarithms. It's greater than zero. Yeah. Then, uh, since f is an element, little f is an element of H, we have that f is either eventually smaller than log H, or since now they, we are dealing with two elements in capital H, <coughs> or f is eventually bigger than log h and, and now exponentiate e to the power f eventually less than h or to the power f bigger than eventually h right <clears throat> okay so so this shows that we have a, at least a hausdorff field yeah so h e to the power f a hausdorff field and now uh, the differential equation that e to the power f satisfies oh. uh, from e to the power f prime equals f prime e to the power f. Uh, it follows e. It follows easily. Yeah, it's a kind of routine exercise. Um, that this is actually closed under um, under the derivation. Uh, sorry. Oh, of course, I should also have said in advance that this is a, a, a set of C1 germs, yeah? yeah. It's e to the power of f. I should have said that in advance, right? Since H consists of C1 germs and e to the f is a C1 germ, uh, the field it generates, <coughs> uh, the Hausdorff field it generates also C1. <clears throat> okay, so that is um, these elementary consequences of the consequences. <clears throat> right, so now um, let's um, see how far we then 
get in building house or in building hardy fields we have uh, that's 2.16 let's define um what we mean by a leoville closed out of a hardy field yeah h is leoville closed Well, the definition is simply that it's um, it's real closed. Yeah, closed under the same algebraic operations, if you like. Um, <clears throat> real closed and um, and closed under um, anti derivatives and exponentials. Or n every h h in h um, has an antiderivative has antiderivative yeah. an element whose derivative is h has an antiderivative in h and also it's exponential and and uh, e to the power h in h. Right. Now, um, this looks perhaps a little special, um, these two last conditions, but it's really saying that you can solve first order linear differential equations. So let me, or this is not a definition, but it's an equivalence that you should exercise also equivalent to um well first of all real closed again and every differential equation um let's say ode for ordinary differential equation y prime plus f y equals g um with coefficients f and g in h has a solution has a non-trivial solution in other words a solution that's not zero has a solution y in h which is not zero yeah this is the superscript not equal is is um our abbreviation for uh, the non-zero elements of an additive group. <clears throat> right. I mean, of course, in other words, if G, if the right-hand side G happens to be zero, then this ordinary differential equation has a trivial solution, Y is zero, but that doesn't count. You have to have a non-zero solution to it. <clears throat> um, and of course, if the right-hand side G is not zero, then then any solution in H must be also non-zero. <clears throat> um, okay, yeah, so this is just a, a little exercise. Um, and uh, right, and now we have that, that um, is it 27, 216 or two, two, 216, I think, not 217. Two, two Wait a minute. Yeah. Right. So, uh, what we have um, done can be kind of summarized by saying that uh, for every Hardy field that contains at least all the real numbers, that is the smallest. Liouville closed extension uh, that is a smallest um, Liouville closed Hardy field extension uh, extension of H. Because you just close off under, well, same algebraic operations, that means 
make sure that it's real closed and close off, off under antiderivatives and um, um, <clears throat> exponentials. Right, the reason that we are assuming here that H contains the reals is that if you would join one antiderivative, you would join them all. So you don't have to make a choice, right? Because two antiderivatives of an LM of a, of a germ dif differ by a real constant. <clears throat> um, right, uh, we denote it by L I H here. Yeah? So this is the you can the Liouville closure, the, the Hardy Liouville closure of H. <clears throat> yeah. Hardy Liouville closure. If you like, <clears throat> um, yeah, this is so. If you take, for example, the Liouville closure of the reals, <clears throat> yeah, L I L I R, yeah. So you, yeah. So note that this contains, in particular, the identity function, the germ of the identity function L I R. Any, um, right? Because um, you have to have a solution to the differential equation y prime equals one. And so that has to, and that means you have to include uh, x. <clears throat> so, and then of course the Liouville closure of the of r is closed under um, exponentiation and uh, taking logarithms. And so this contains already all the so-called logarithmic exponential functions that Hardy was focusing on. Uh, Contains uh, contains all logarithmic. So it's it's all actually a lot a lot bigger because it's also closed under antiderivatives. It contains all logarithmic exponential functions or germs of them, of course. Functions considered by considered by Hardy. And his theorem about it is that if you have a logarithmic exponential function, then it's eventually positive, eventually zero or eventually negative. And so this is a special, and that's a special case of what we, what we have done. <clears throat> um, so, right, um, yeah, maybe I should, mention a few more general remarks. I mean, this is a definitely a theorem that uh, Hardy um, liked and, and um, and uh, in that connection, I want to make a few general remarks. Um, so call a germ. Yeah, when I say germ, um, I, I usually mean germ at plus infinity. Um, and any representative, representative of the germ of it, call it Hardian. If it lives in a Hardy field, if it uh, lies in a Hardy field. So the way to think about a Hardian germ, a Hardian function is that it is of very regular growth. Yeah? Um, can think of it Hardian as Um, has very regular growth. It's very because not only itself, uh, the germ itself grows in a very regular way, um, <clears throat> monotone eventually, 
<clears throat> strictly monotone or eventually constant or strictly um, um, strictly increasing or eventually constant or strictly decreasing, uh, but also all the derivatives of it as well. And not and even all the polynomials or rational functions in that in uh, the germ and all its derivatives. So it is it, it is a very strong um, fact about a germ being Hardian. Mm. Um, well, of course, there are still stronger conditions like being O minimal that it generates an O minimal um, expansion of the real field. But um, for the moment, this is this is already a very uh, striking fact to to know that. Uh, and it's also remarkable that so many functions in natural functions in mathematics are actually Hardian, right? <clears throat> um, right. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. I want to make another, a few other general remarks, but more of a technical nature, namely about differential. We already used the term differential ring, but um, I want to be a little bit more precise now. Uh, 2.2. Wait, where am I? Yeah. 2.2. Um, remarks on differential rings. I want to formally introduce a few notions related to the differential rings. Um, yeah, for us, it will just be a commutative ring. <clears throat> Is a commutative ring. And for me, a, a ring always has a, an identity element. Um, so I'm not going to write that. Uh, but it's equipped with a, a derivation, with a derivation. And I will actually now define it formally. A so it's a map from the ring to itself. And you think of A prime as a kind of derivative of A, um, such that A plus B, well, the usual, you know, the additive, is, the map is additive and it satisfies the product rule or Leibniz rule. <clears throat> and then you can easily show mm -hmm. Here A, B, and in R. And if you have a if you can if you have a unit, then you can actually show that this is satisfies the quotient rule, A prime B minus A B prime or A in R and B a unit in order for this quotient to make sense. So I leave it to you to check that. Um, <clears throat> right. So associated to a differential ring. So let R be a let R be a differential ring below. Um, with derivation, yeah. I mean, I use here the suggestive notation a prime for the derivative of a. But the, the map itself is often called delta or, or D or something with uh, derivation delta. And um, <clears throat> so we have um, uh, then uh, CR is all the elements in R that are this is a definition, uh, A and R such that A prime is zero or delta A is zero, is a subring. R, call the ring of constants. Huh? The elements with derivative zero we call constants. Call the ring of constants. 
ah, I, uh, I forgot what I really wanted to say. For us, a differential ring is actually always containing Q. It is a commutative ring containing Q as a subring. Yeah. I don't want to deal with characteristic P uh, here in this course. Containing Q as a subring. Yeah. And that was in called the ring of constants. Uh, of R. Right. <clears throat> now, for us, almost as important as the derivation itself is the associated logarithmic derivative. Uh, so almost as important for us as delta is the associated logarithmic derivative map map um, from which is um, I usually write this way a goes yeah the logarithmic derivative of a is a a I write it as a dagger yeah so this symbol is a dagger symbol which is a prime over a. And of course, this is only defined for units. So R cross is the uh, multiplicative group of units of R. And so <clears throat> this is a map from the multiplicative group into the additive group. And it is actually, it satisfies the um, obvious, the, the natural laws for such a map, namely, um, Satisfying that the logarithmic derivative of the of a product ah logarithmic derivative of a product is the sums of the logarithmic derivatives. Yeah, and then line and then of course also um you get um, the in, so it's a homomorphism from multiplicative group into the additive group. So in particular, you also have uh, that uh, the logarithmic derivative of A inverse is minus A dagger. And um, this has then useful consequences like when two daggers are equal, that only that is if that is the case, even only if A is a, a unit times B, you know, a, a constant, a constant unit times B. Um, and in particular, A dagger is zero, even only if A is itself a unit, uh, a constant unit. Um, right, so here, here all A, B are all units. Right, so these things will, will be, will be used all the time. <clears throat> okay. Um, aha, now, so the kind of rings to, of course, um, ah, yeah, let me note, note. Our Hardy fields are in particular differential rings in this context, um, <clears throat> since they contain Q. And um, uh, the ring of constants here, yeah, if you have a Hardy field, then the constants are exactly the real numbers that happen to be in H. Yeah. Right. But often we will just deal with Hardy fields that already contains all of R. <clears throat> Okay, um, but of course there are other differential rings that play a role in the whole subject, namely in particular C, yeah, uh, C less than infinity, C, infinity, C, omega are useful differential rings for us. Rings 
for us. Because all our constructions of Hardy fields will, will play, will take place inside these ambient rings. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> right. Uh huh. Yeah, another thing. Um, it will be very important to sometimes change the derivation by multiplying it with a unit for V in R. For V a unit, uh, we also have the derivation Yeah, um, V inverse R, V inverse delta, right? So um, it assigns to every element uh, V inverse A prime, yeah, from R to R. And uh, so if you change the derivation this way, and we will often have to do, to do that uh, for, um, for reasons that will, I hope we come clear at some point. Um, we denote the course the um, yeah. Let me say it's like a change of variables. Um, this is like change of variables. I hope this will become clear later why. Um, and um, we let and R superscript phi is the, is R is is the differential ring R with this new derivation instead of the old one. Uh, let me is um, let me say is the differential ring is R with the derivation um, phi inverse delta instead of delta instead of delta. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. We will say a lot more about this uh, yeah. later on. So, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Raoul, may I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what, why do you prefer to work with a phi minus one delta instead of phi delta? Yeah, because certain formulas become, uh, <laughs> um, well, the thing is that um, experience shows that this works better. Okay, that's, that's a good that's choice. You, okay, uh, but certain a lot of formulas that we we will have to um, uh, deal with are uh, become simpler this way. Okay. But, okay. Yeah. Ultimately, it is a choice, of course. Um, but, okay. But um, yeah. No. Well, maybe. It's maybe a satisfying I'll, answer. Okay. Uh, note. Maybe I. Suppose you have two units, V1, V2. Um, four, V1, comma, V2. Uh, yeah, would that still be, let me see, would that still be true? Yeah, it would also be true if I had taken the other choice, right? Um, yeah, so this is not the, what makes the difference, but uh, okay. Um, yeah, well, I hope we'll see why at some point. Okay, okay. okay. we'll see, okay. So a few other uh, comments about, um, oh yeah, I want to, make some some hardy field asymptotics hardy fields we've already seen a 
seen something like uh, if if f is uh, bigger than all the constants, then its derivative is is positive, and if f is infinitesimal, then its derivative is also infinitesimal. Um, but there are many rules that Hardy field satisfy about, about asymptotics. So here is a, a small list, two, three, one. And uh, let's say um, asymptotic rules, some asymptotic rules. Yeah, uh, asymptotic rules for let's say non-zero elements gather yeah, in a Hardy field. Uh, one, if F is strictly dominated by G, then when you take um, the logarithmic derivatives, it is, becomes an ordinary inequality. So if F is strictly dominated by G, then, then F dagger is less than G dagger, right? So uh, have to be very careful in writing these things because the, the less than symbol looks a little bit like the strict dominance symbol, but of course you have to keep them apart here. Um, and okay, F is, here's another one. If F is strictly dominated by G, but but G is not a real number, yeah, it's not a constant, then, then F prime is strictly dominated. Yeah, so here is strictly dominated by G prime. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, there will be four of them and I will prove them all. Um, if F is strictly, and of course these things are really, you really want H to be a Hardy field. This would not be true for uh, C1 germs, for example, um, even assuming that F and G are units uh, in the ring of, in, in, in one of those differential rings C less than infinity, these rules would not hold there. Um, so F, ah, so here you see a, um reversal f dagger weakly dominates g dagger yeah so of course in the part one we saw that f strictly dominated with g implies f dagger less than g dagger but um, um but you see here that for dominance the it's reversed so to say um oh yeah and then the Likewise, F, if, so the first part was about two infinitesimals, F and G, and here you have two infinitely large things, F and G, and then it is. In one, do you assume that uh, F is greater than R? Um, I hope not. Um, I, I'll, I'll get to, when, when I see the proof, then I'll, We'll see that. I don't, I hope I'm, I'm not uh, making a mistake there. Um, but let's go to the proof and see if we use that or not. I, um, this, what is this list? Oh, yeah. Four. And in four is, in some sense, the most surprising one. And really, um, in some ways, the most crucial one. If F is bounded and G is, um, well, either infinitesimal or infinitely large, <clears throat> then F prime is always strictly dominated by the logarithmic derivative of G, right? Again, um, I'm assuming that F and G are non-zero, so this logarithmic derivative makes sense. Um, okay. 
So these are just four rules. There are lots more, but I think these are some of the most frequently used. Um, so let F be um, strictly dominated by G and to show F dagger less than G dagger. Um, we can assume that they are both positive. Fg are positive because um, <clears throat> f dagger and minus f, the dagger of minus f are equal. Yeah, since minus f dagger is f dagger. Yeah, minus one, the dagger of minus one is zero. And so, uh, and so you can always replace F and G by the negatives if you like, and therefore arrange that uh, F and G are positive. Okay. Uh, then we have that G over F, since F is strictly dominated by G, G over F strictly dominates one, right? And is positive. G over F. Uh, bigger than zero, so it's actually then bigger than all the real number g over f. So its derivative is positive, um, being in a Hardy field. Yeah, um, so g prime f minus g f prime is positive, right? If you take the quotient rule. You get f squared in the denominators, um, and hence, and thus, uh, g, okay, what happened in that? Oh, and thus, g prime f bigger than, no, g prime f bigger than uh, g f prime, uh, and now divide by f and g, so if you divide both sides by fg, you get g dagger bigger than f dagger. Oh yeah, which is of course the, the same as saying that f dagger is less than g dagger. Right. Two. Um, yeah, so these are fairly, simple manipulations, so let F now be strictly dominated by G and but G not a real number, right? Um, right, you have to show that the, the derivative of F is strictly dominated by the derivative of, of G. Um, oh, to prove F prime, strictly dominated by G prime. Uh, again, we arrange F and G to be positive. Uh, F and G positive. Um, yeah, well, because, you know, again, changing F into minus f, uh, of course, it changes the derivative of f to the negative of the derivative, but the strict dominance relations involve only the absolute value. So you can um, safely do that. <clears throat> um, yeah, then, uh, well, <clears throat> let me see. Okay, f prime is, um, right, so if F and G are positive and F is strictly dominated by G, then F prime will certainly, well, now I'm a little confused, what am I writing here? F prime is, um, oh, Let me, um, maybe. 
Yeah, we have. I think we are using one, right? Um, we are going. We have. Um, F dagger less than G dagger by one. Less than G dagger by one. Um, so, so what does that mean? Uh, you get um, F prime less than G by E. F prime is less than f over g times g prime yeah and now <clears throat> uh, which is dominated by oh which is dominated by g prime since f F divided by G is, is infinitesimal, um, right? Oh, um, yeah, but that's not exactly what I want, right? I want F prime to be strictly dominated by, here it says F prime is less than something that is strictly dominated by G prime. But uh, if f prime is very negative, that doesn't it doesn't follow that f prime is strictly dominated by g prime. But um, maybe I overlooked something here. Um, oh, the last step also, of course, uses that g is g prime is not zero. Yeah, g prime. Uh, for this last, right. Well, I was a little bit too hasty here. I think what, what am I? Um, <clears throat> so let me see. No, no, chat me, by Vincenzo. Excuse me. There is some chat by Vincenzo. Yeah, I don't. I, I'm not so good in, in these chats, but uh, let me, should I click on it? What, 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 how does that work? Um, well, he says, are you sure that uh, you don't want to assume that G is not comparable to one rather than just uh, G doesn't belong to R? It's not. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I probably made a mistake here. Some in the assumptions or um but i don't want to to spend too much time on this maybe in the in the office hours we can we can figure this out exactly so um so but so he thinks that um that we want g not asymptotic to to one here um in the same archimedian class yes um <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I mean, the counterexample would be you take f infinitesimal and then you take f plus one. Uh, and that would be a counterexample to two if you, if you leave it in this form. Wait a minute. If you take what? Say again. Uh, so take f uh, infinitesimal. Oh, and then g equals f plus one. Yeah. Oh, right. And then, of course, they have the same derivatives. Yeah. So this is definitely wrong. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, um, so, um, well, so you, you just say G not equivalent. Yeah. Right. Uh, let me, um, let me just not asymptotic to one. Uh, yeah, there are these. But even that, um, you see, uh, when I wrote down, I, I just thought, hey, I only need this. But then, of course, I made a mistake um, to be checked. I'll, I'll 
I'll check this and or someone can 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 um, make sure that this right. Okay, so this I hope that three and four doesn't depend on this. Um, so F. Oh yeah, three is easy because F strictly dominated by G strictly dominated by one gives by one F dagger less than G dagger less than one dagger, which is zero. Yeah, uh, so F dagger. Um, yeah, so you have then two negative elements F dagger and G dagger. Uh, both negative and um, one less than the other, and but that means, of course, that f dagger is um, since we are looking at absolute value values, f dagger is dominates g dagger in the weak sense. Mm. And um, the other part of three, I'll leave. I'll um, yeah, I leave as an exercise. In some sense, four is the most important one. So let me let me uh, make sure that that at least is correct. So let f be uh, yeah. Those are the assumptions in in the last part, right? F f uh, right, and I want to show that the derivative of f is strictly dominated by the logarithmic derivative of g. Um, so replacing f by f plus one, uh, just what Vincenzo suggested in another context, if necessary. Um, uh, arrange that it's actually Asymptotic to one, yeah, arrange. So if it's, if it's infinitesimal, then by adding one, it becomes uh, as some, uh, how do you say compare? Yeah, yeah, you call this comparable to one. Yeah, for some reason, the word comparable, we are using it in a different way. And so I would prefer to avoid that, but then I don't have a good, I think I call this asymptotic, this um, two, but, um, I think that's what you are using with for this tilde thing. So this is um, a little bit. Um, but, but then what, how do you call the tilde one? Yeah, I think we call, yeah, what did you call it? <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think I, I'm going to look it up in, in uh, Hardy's little book to see how he calls it. Or, um, right, anyway, arrange F. As in, um, equivalent to one in this sense. <clears throat> um, and this is then, wait a minute. Uh, oh yeah, and G can of course be, um, we can assume that G is, uh, strictly dominates one because we can always replace G by one over G, yeah? Replacing F by F plus one and G by one over G. You see then the logarithmic derivative will still have the same absolute value. <clears throat> um, right. Range, yes. Okay, then, well, the thing is, if if f is strictly dominated by g and um, f is bounded, that means that f to the k is also strictly dominated by g. Well, then f to the k is strictly dominated by g for all uh, k and z. And they are all bounded and g is unbounded, hence um, 
if you take logarithmic derivatives, f to the k dagger is less than, yeah, um, g dagger, yeah, i.e. k f dagger less than g dagger, yeah. Uh, yeah, for all k, yeah? all k. And that means that f dagger uh, is strictly dominated by g dagger. And so f prime, which is um, Right now I'm a little bit, what am I writing here? It's F dagger, so F prime is um, F F dagger. Uh, ah, right, yeah, F prime is F F dagger. <clears throat> uh, and F is equivalent to one in this sense. So this means that um, you get indeed from f dagger strictly dominated by g dagger, also f f dagger strictly dominated by g dagger, right? And so that's, yeah, that's the argument. <clears throat> yeah, so I'll, at some point I will come back to, to two because that was not stated correctly. <clears throat> Wait, I have this. Um, okay, now, um, yeah, let me ex <laughs> yeah, so exercise, well, let me actually say it as an exercise, something that I believe is a little bit more general than two, and so then, then I'm, um, and now I'm stated in a form that I know is correct because I copied it from, from the book from uh, for FG and FG not equivalent to one in this, this sense, uh, F, yeah, so this is sort of the most symmetric formulation. Yeah, uh, oh, FG not asymptotic, not equivalent to one. <clears throat> right. Um, yeah, so you can think of this as you can integrate and differentiate these, this dominance relation, right? <clears throat> and so this is a very uh, useful thing also. <clears throat> yeah, now, Let me make some very general statement. There's much more to say about Hardy asymptotics. About Hardy asymptotics. Um, and in a little paper by Abram Robinson, he actually tried to axiomatize Hardy asymptotics in some way, but he didn't quite succeed. Um, <clears throat> but we can actually completely axiomatize all the Hardy asymptotics. Um, <clears throat> so for general, just for general orientation, I'm not going to prove this, um, at least not now. Uh, any asymptotic rule, any asymptotic, so I, I Asymptotic rule valid in all Hardy fields. Is 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 a logical consequence or can be deduced from uh, can be deduced from the axioms for H fields with small derivation can be deduced. On the actions. Of course, this is a bit vague, right? But you can make this precise. Um, 
for H fields. Yeah. Remember, an H field is an ordered differential field with the property that if an element is bigger than all the constants, then its derivative is positive. And also that any bounded element, anything that is bounded by an absolute value by a constant is equal to a constant plus an infinitesimal element. Um, an infinitesimal meaning smaller in absolute value than all non-zero constants. On the constant for eight fields with small derivation. Small derivation meaning that the derivative of an infinitesimal is always infinitesimal. Right. <clears throat> so, an S, you can think of, you can formalize the notion of asymptotic rule as simply saying it's a universal sentence in the language of um, ordered valued differential fields, right? Where you have a, the symbol for the dominance relation for, or several dominance relations, um, dominant, strict dominance, weak dominance, and and this uh, asymptotic equivalence. Um, and you have this, the symbols for the ring operations and the derivation, and also you have a symbol for the ordering. So any universal sentence of that kind, um, you can think of that as a potential rule, asymptotic rule, right? And, uh, and here we have uh, some of them because you can think of this as for all FG such that so-and-so, we have so-and-so. And so all of them that are actually correct in Hardy fields must be consequences of, of a few of those few that I mentioned. So, yeah, this is actually a consequence of our, uh, well, of, of the various things that we now know about Hardy fields. I think this was not really known, let's say five years ago, um, but it, right. Okay. Um, Lau? Yeah. And if you uh, consider only uh, Liouville closed RD fields, do you get some more, uh, as in some extra synthetic rule or? Um, uh, no, I don't think so. No. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that's, I don't think so. Of course, you, you can extend your language. I mean, I've, I've not been very precise. You could also add a, uh, to your language here, for example, uh, the operation that assigns to any bounded element the, the nearest constant, right? So to say the standard part map. And then the, that would, what I say would still be true. Um, and for Liouville closed fields, you could add exp and, and log in your language. And then I'm not sure, well, yeah, no, I don't think that's known. Yeah, good question. Um, certainly for an extended language with X and log, uh, that would certainly make sense to ask, but I, I don't know. Mm. Complete. Yeah, I want to get back to composition. Uh, let's. Let's have now a C1 germ, which is bigger than all, um, eventually bigger than all constants, right? In other words, and so L, and suppose that its derivative is, a, is an element in H, yeah? And for various reasons, we, we denote it often by phi. In fact, it will play the same kind of role of phi as when you change the derivation um, right. Okay, first of all, note, since L is infinitely large, its derivative is positive. That means that phi here is, is a positive element in the Hardy field. Um, and also we can, and we have, have the Hardy field. You can always adjoin L, 
right? Because its derivative is in H. And in fact, most of the time that we use this, L is already in H. <clears throat> um, yeah. Okay, now it, it turns out that for us, the right composition is not with L, but with the compositional inverse of L. Uh, it turns out uh, that composition on the right, on the right with right uh, L inf. Yeah, this is the compositional inverse of L as a germ. I, I think I introduced it in my second lecture. Um, or maybe in my first, uh, yeah, is, is what we should focus on, is what we should. Now, uh, let me first mention uh, again by the usual um, rules for taking derivatives of compositional inverse. Um, this is uh, yeah, so here phi inverse is really the multiplicative inverse, right? While the superscript inf there denotes the compositional inverse. <coughs> um, and um, yeah, so think of, of this composition as a kind of change of variables. Yeah, yeah. this composition. is a kind of change of variable. So instead of the usual time t, you um, it's um, it's given by this function as kind of change of variable. Uh, and we have this ring automorphism. Yeah, this composition with L inf gives you a ring isomorphism from C1 to C1. Um, F. Sorry, now I, I didn't. Now, can I interrupt you a moment? Yeah. So no, I didn't understood in the note, the left-hand side depends on the derivation and the right-hand side doesn't. Uh, oh yeah, of course. Uh, what I mean is, is um, um, wait, what am, I, what, what am I saying? Wait a minute, but phi is, is the derivative of L, right? Oh. Yeah, phi, no, the derivative of L is involved here um, via phi, right? Phi, okay. was, phi was the, the derivative, of, yeah, right. Okay, thanks. thanks. Sorry, for, uh, yeah. We have the ring isomorphism F, yeah, for, since we are using this so often, I, we will just write F circle for F composed with L inf of yeah C one right uh, so if you have a C one germ and you compose it with a C one germ you you get again a C one germ um, right yeah so let me see here recall V is L prime. We have the ring isomorphism, um, right? Which also respects the, 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 the asymptotic relations in both directions and the ordering as well, the partial ordering. <clears throat> um, and uh, we have a useful identity with uh, a, which we will interpret in a certain way. 
I mean, if you just use a chain rule and this and uh, this equality for L inf, the derivative of L inf, uh, you can uh, you see that the derivative of F circle equals um v inverse yeah it's just uh, a straightforward computation using the chain rule and this equality for the derivative of l inf um I, i'm sure you, i can leave that to you too i'll put it there. yeah mm. now um okay for F in H, yeah, so this is just for germs in C1, but for F in H, this gives uh, that F circle prime is, all, is also is in H circle, which is, of course, H composed with L inf. If you compose all the elements in capital H with L inf on the right, you get some, again, a Hardy field. Um, no. Oh, yes. yes. Sorry, uh, in your formula, uh, are you sure that phi minus one should be taken in within the parentheses? Uh, well, I, um, I don't have my book. I have, I, well, wait a, I, um, sorry, I don't have my notes with me, so I hope I copied it correctly. Uh, <laughs> should, should, I, we do, I, should we do the, let's do the computation in the, in the, in the office hour and okay. check that it's really correct. Uh, because um, I just did, you know, it's just, uh, uh, I hope I'm correct. Um, I think, no, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm sure I'm correct. Uh, because otherwise, well, the other things I'm going to say would be would be wrong, and that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> not a very good argument, though. <laughs> but <clears throat> um, okay, uh, F circle prime is uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but before you mentioned that the new derivative phi minus one delta is yeah. connected with this change of variables, right? Yes, I'm, I'm just going to say now how. Uh, uh, okay. What this really tells you is that, um, so first of all, H circle is again a Hardy field. Not just, we already know that uh, if you compose a Hausdorff field with uh, such a germ that goes to infinity, you get a Hausdorff field. But now it's even a hard, but in this case, this H circle is a Hardy field because if you take the derivative of F circle, you get again something that is of the form the circle of something in H uh, is a Hardy field. And how is this related to? Yeah, this is again is a Hardy field. Yeah. Um, right um now um and we have the yes i'm just going to say now the ordered and valued field isomorphism from h to h circle um which sends h to h circle this is really an ordered field isomorphism and also it preserves the dominance relation in both directions which means it's a valued field isomorphism but it's not a differential field it's not a differential field isomorphism unless uh, l happens to be the identity or the identity plus a constant unless yeah, of course, if, if L is X plus a constant, then L prime, which is phi, would be one. And then, um, uh, 
is not the differential field unless L equals X plus a constant. But what, what this really shows is that it's a, a differential field isomorphism, but it is differential field isomorphism where you replace H by H superscript V, the differential field H V, right? Right, so um, where H superscript V recall is the is uh, is just the the field H, but now with the derivation, the usual derivation replaced by uh, V inverse times that derivation, and that is what what really this says here, and this is this is how we are going to. The thing is that this this A super that this operation H goes to H superscript V is purely differential algebraic in nature, right? There's no, nothing um, like composition involved. And so you can study this in a very differential algebraic setting <clears throat> while this composition, well, that, that is really, you know, composing functions and that's, but because of this isomorphism, um, it becomes then also again, a uh, differential algebraic uh, um, business. <clears throat> okay, let me see what is the, um, uh -huh. okay, so this is really all I wanted to say about, about section one. And I now go to section two. No, se this is section two already, sorry. I'm going to, yeah, yeah, all this will come back later and, and um, I just wanted to introduce the notation and, and mention some uh, obvious facts. <clears throat> so I'm going to section three now. And so we can solve very simple differential equations, uh, first order linear. Um, but now I want to solve more general first order, solving first order, order ODEs, uh, ODEs, ordinary differential equation in Hardy fields, not just linear ones, Hardy fields. Um, right. In some sense, to understand Hardy fields model theoretically as differential fields is really trying to understand which equations you can solve uh, in a hard, in Hardy fields or in big enough Hardy fields. Um, yeah. So here's the motivation. Uh, motivation. Um, well, sine x, for example, is of course not in a Hardy field. Sine x is not Hardian. Did I in introduce the term Hardian already? Yes. yes oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that lies in a Hardy field, yeah. Uh, uh, but what about sine, you know, you can tell it, this is because x goes to infinity, so this simply uh, oscillates, but uh, what about sine one over x or sine of any infinitesimal or bounded uh, thing? Um, it is, it, this is Hardian, it is, this is, is Hardian, but it doesn't seem to follow from what we know so far. This is Hardian, but um, seems, but is not a consequence of our extension results so far. But it is, it, this is not a consequence of our extension results so far. 
Um, actually, I'm not absolutely sure about that, but I'm I'm morally convinced that it's not a consequence. Uh, yeah, if you want to be, yeah, a precise statement of that would be saying that it's not in the Liouville closure of R. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sine x one over x. Not in the Liouville closure of R. Yeah. Obtained by taking antiderivatives and closing off under law uh, under x and antiderivatives and semi-algebraic operations. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, uh, Yeah, but let me just make, I don't want to claim this. I, uh, I'm pretty sure this is true. Uh, let me just say, I guess. Probably someone knows a way to prove this. Um, <clears throat> um, okay, but the reason that it's Hardian is that it satisfies the reason, a, a more general kind of first order differential equation is the reason that sign one of x is Hardian is that uh, that it satisfies um, the first order. for the e. Uh, what is it? Y prime t is uh, minus one over t square, square root of one minus y t square. Right? If you, uh, yeah, if you, right? If you take the, the derivative of sine one over x, you get, you get cosine one over x times minus one over x squared. And the cosine, of course, is the square root of one minus the sine squared. So, yeah. And the point is that the, the right hand side here is, a semi, is given by a semi algebraic function. And the right hand side is given is, is, uh, a semi algebraic is given by semi algebraic C one function that means continuously differentiable, uh, let's say of T Y. Well, let me just say minus one over T squared square root of one minus y square. Um, uh, yeah. Right, it's given by a semi-algebraic continuously differentiable function on a certain region in the, in the plane, right? And so we want to, um, to um, prove a general theorem is that when you have some something like that, and first of all, the differential equation where the right hand side is given by a semi algebraic C1 function, that you can always adjoin the solutions to uh, a Hardy field. So, um, okay. <clears throat> uh, to, um, <clears throat> yeah. We prove a general result of this kind. So uh, to make this please, let me first introduce the notation. The notation. Um, for any open set in the, in Rn for open U in Rn, CRU, yeah, the same curly R, but now we are not talking about germs, but about actual functions, is the ring of of R times continuously differentiable 
differentiable real valued functions on u. Functions on u to r. And r here could be uh, a natural number or infinity. Um, C omega u also makes sense. You find likewise. Yeah, instead of continuously differentiable, you say real analytic. Okay. Um, yeah, again, in this section, H will be a Hardy field. And, um, and when I say germ, I will mean a germ of a function at plus infinity. Uh, yeah, okay, so 3.1. Now I want to state the general fact that I hinted at. Uh, let me say this is the explicit case because I want to say later on something about um, ordinary differential equations which are um, in a less explicit form, the explicit case. Um, and that is the following proposition. Um, so, yeah, when, when you talk about differential equations, you have to be a little precise about the mains and the remains of definitions of various data. So let U be open and semi algebraic, be open and semi algebraic. And suppose uh, oh let me before I do that I have to introduce the function capital phi which is plays the role of this minus one over t square square root of one minus y square. Um, so Oh, why doesn't it go away? Huh. My eraser doesn't work anymore. Ah, okay. I, I just clicked on something that made the eraser disappear, but uh, I think now it works again. Um, let phi, phi, from u to r be uh, semi algebraic, or oh, be uh, also semi algebraic, and, and in C1u. Yeah, so it's just, well, I could have said this directly. Let phi in C1u be semi algebraic. Um, suppose. We have n germs in H and that and now the solution that we are going to consider of a different eta, let this be a C1 germ, be such that and now I write down exactly the conditions. Um, that makes sense that uh, where the differential equation makes sense. So star, first of all, I want H1T comma, no, let me, to simplify notation, let me just write it as HT, H, HT, which is simply H1T, comma, HNT, 
Of course, this is only defined for big enough T, right? But H T and eta T should be in U eventually, um, such that eventually, yeah, let me write the word eventually here. That means for all sufficiently large T and eta prime T equals capital V H T eta T. Yeah. So this is the differential equation that eta prime satisfies. It's um, where the right-hand side given by this function V is, is semi-algebraic and C1. Um, and uh, yeah, the, this condition that H T eta T is in U is simply to make sure that V of H T eta T is, makes sense, <clears throat> right? Since V is defined only on U. <clears throat> okay, in that case, you eta must lie in a Hardy field extension, yeah, then eta lies in a Hardy field extension of uh, H. Um, eta, right, yeah, right. Again, it doesn't look very nice what I wrote here. Let me, eta. Eta lies in a Hardy field extension. Right. You can make this a bit more precise uh, uh, if R contained in H, uh, H real closed. Um, H, eta, RC is, is a Hardy field. In other words, eta generates <clears throat> um, a real closed Hardy field extension, so to say. Yeah. H eta itself might not be a Hardy field. It might be too small, but uh, if you go to the real closure of, of the Hausdorff field H eta, then you get a Hardy field, is a Hardy field. And so, Hausdorff fields H, the intermediate Hausdorff field H eta will, will, will show up here. Um, okay, so that is the statement. I hope it's, um, but now I have to watch out. Um, I think the, I'm not going to finish this proof in the uh, time le uh, left, um, but well, I can I can I can certainly start it and 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 see. Yeah, right. I hope the statement is clear. You have the semi-algebraic function given on an on a domain in R n plus one. <clears throat> you have these um, h one up to h n in h and eta and c one. Yeah, maybe I'll just give the before I give the proof. Let me give the the, the obvious application that um, have to be it has to do with adjoining sines and cosines of bounded functions. Yeah, so um, that H B and H bounded uh, then. Of course, you can form the sine of H and the cosine of H, and they lie in a Hardy field, lie in a, well, in the same Hardy field actually, lies in the common Hardy field extension. And this is, this is not just a curiosity, this is really something that, that plays a role in certain arguments lies in the common Hardy field extension. Uh, of H. Proof. Um, well, using the 
proposition. Um, well, first, we want to reduce to the case that H is infinitesimal. So uh, we can take, we just take uh, a constant, uh, take C and R such that um, such that H is a constant plus an infinitesimal um, epsilon. Oh, um, I guess I have to first arrange that H contains the reals. Yeah? Arrange H contains all the reals because um, otherwise this infinitesimal might not be an H yet. Right, yeah. So C is simply the limit of S as H of H T as T goes to plus infinity. <clears throat> and um, and then you subtract a, that limit and you get an infinitesimal. And then um, of course the what is it? The cosine of um, of of H is simply the cosine of C plus epsilon, which is some linear combination of the sine of epsilon and the cosine of epsilon. Yeah, I don't care which a cosine epsilon plus b sine epsilon. And a, b are certain real numbers. Um, and then, um, okay, now, so this reduces us to the case where, where our h is the infinitesimal epsilon. Now, sine h, sine epsilon satisfies that ODE, um, Y prime uh, T equals epsilon prime T uh, square root of one minus <clears throat> IT square, right? Yeah, just like with sine of one over X. Um, and that means so we can apply apply um, <clears throat> proposition that I that was here proposition three one one three one one three one one with n equals one. No, with n equals two here, n equals two, uh, and phi, phi would be the, the two variable, same in algebraic C1 function, S1 times the square root of one minus S2 square. Um, where minus, where S1 can take all values and S2, is between minus one and one. Right. Yeah, so this is the semi algebraic region U in R2. Um, oh, wait a minute. N is not two here, but one because phi is in N plus one variable. So I. Uh, Right. Um, and the H function, the, the, the coefficient function that the, 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 the H function that also appears in the differential equation, that would be epsilon, that would be epsilon prime, I think. Uh, right. And H is here, there's only one A function from H, namely epsilon prime that, that show that. Is appears <clears throat> and phi it's yeah right so it's a straightforward application of the previous result that then uh, you can uh, join the the sine of epsilon um, and get a and then of course the the cosine of epsilon is automatically if you, once you go to the real closure um, the cosine of epsilon will also be there and um, 
and then the cosine of h is just this linear linear combination of them. So I think that that should make it clear. Um, Lau, yeah, yes, yeah, sorry, may I have a, ask a small question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, how do how um, can it happen if you try to add the unrestricted sign? Sine of t, for instance, because it seems to me that it it also satisfies such algebraic uh, differential uh, equation. Yeah, well, well, except that um, if you take the unrestricted sign and you take this differential equation, then um, the problem is that the square root. Then you take values of the square root that are zero, and there the square root function is not c one. Yeah, the square, the positive square root function, non-negative square root function, is uh, it's semi-algebraic, but it's not C one unless you restrict your um, what is under the square root to to be strictly positive. Okay, thank you. That 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 really, yeah. You see, that's why why it's really important here that I'm assuming that phi is in C one. I think one can actually weaken the conditions a bit, like something with Lipschitz conditions, um, but, but the square root function is, is definitely um, violates um, the conditions that guarantee, uh, you, uh, you see, you need conditions that guarantee a unique solution with given initial condition. And, um, and the square root function, when you allow the, the value zero is not uh, violates that. <clears throat> so this is, um, <clears throat> Yeah, we'll see that in the proof that, that this really plays a role. Um, now I'm, I still have, yeah, I can start the proof. I mean, it, I can just make a few obvious comments for, uh, to start the proof. Um, of the so now this, yeah. this, um, this function sine of one over X, if you take a representative of its germ, can it live in a non-minimal structure? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, um, this is also um, uh, a, an O-minimal theorem, right? I mean, if you um, if you have germs H1 to Hn from some O-minimal expansion of the real field instead of in capital H, and you have a solution of a differential equation like that, then you can automatically adjoin it to to your O minimal expansion, and that will still be O minimal. Yeah, so, so this is not just, uh, yes, that's definitely true. Um, th oh yeah, this is just a special case of this Pfeffian, this Pfeffian closure business. Ah, uh, okay. Um, right, okay. Um, okay, so. Well, first of all, in the proof, we pass first to a real, to the situation where the reals are all there, passing to an extension. Um, your range H contains all the reals and H is real closed. Right, I mean, um, if you look at the theorem, um, there's really no harm in, in making H bigger. Um, differential equation will will stay the same, uh, of course. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Um, now the claim that I am going to state claim one there will be three claims um, is that then you can already you, well this is something you have to show anyway right eta k has to be eta t has to be less than zero eventually or equal to zero eventually or greater than zero eventually, yeah? 
Um, the thing is we want to know this not just for eta, but also for eta minus eights. But the point is that eta minus eights will just satisfy a similar differential equation. And so it's basically enough to do it for eta. Anyway, that, that will um, uh, towards this claim, proving this claim. Um, you may as well assume that this is that you have eta t equal to zero for arbitrary large t. Let's suppose eta t zero for arbitrary large Yeah, because if that doesn't happen, if eta t is non-zero for our, for almost for all sufficiently large t, it would mean that eta t is less than zero eventually, or greater than zero eventually, right? So you may as well assume that this is the case, and then you have to show that you are in the the middle case, namely that eta is zero, uh, not just for arbitrary large t, but for all sufficiently large t. Yeah? enough to to derive to show eta t zero for uh, eventually right and right uh, let me see. Yeah. Now, at this point, it is useful to replace these germs by representatives. So, um, take, um, right, take a real number and representatives. Uh, H1, HN, uh, HN, sorry, it gets worse and worse when I start to correct this, HN, HN, eta, um, which are really now C1 functions on the interval from A to plus infinity, right? Uh, of their germs. Yeah, and again, we usually use the same letters for the germs and their representatives just to keep things simple notationally. Um, and such that, but you can do that in such a way that, that the differential equation is now satisfied not just eventually but for all t bigger than a a right so star i want star to hold now for all t bigger than a uh, i'm such that uh, star holds for all bigger than a okay now um if t is bigger than a and eta t is zero yeah as we are supposing that eta t is zero for arbitrary large t so there will be lots of t's t's that go to infinity even where eta t is zero but then But that means that in particular, ht comma zero will be in U, um, right? I mean, if you go back to star, H, ht eta t will always be in U now for t bigger than a. So if eta t is zero, that means that ht comma zero is in U. But this will, this will then happen for arbitrary large t so that means that this will be true for eventually. Yeah. Therefore, 
HT0. And here we are really using this proposition of last, of last uh, time, HT eventually. Not just for arbitrary large, but <clears throat> for all T sufficiently large. Um, by proposition, by this proposition that I started with last Tuesday, proposition 181. Um, right. And well, I think I should probably stop here and then uh, continue. I will start again with the stating the proposition next time and, uh, and uh, make quickly make this reduction. But um, <clears throat> and it's it's not a really difficult, but uh, and, uh, um, and very long, but it's too long to to finish now. So I'll ask. Um, we'll finish proof. Uh, next time. So there will, of course, this is. I'm not yet close to proving claim one, but uh, that's most of the work. Then claim two and claim three are fairly easy. We'll finish proof next time. Um, right. Ultimately, claim three will will be that H eta is a Hausdorff field, and when you take its real closure, you will get a Hardy field. And H eta R C is a Hardy field. So here you will typically see Hausdorff fields in showing up as intermediate stages. Um, Hardy field. Okay, I'll stop. <clears throat>